Well, thank you all very much. I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease for the first part of my talk, and I'm promising you, when I'm done with that part of the talk, you will know just about as much about Alzheimer's as most anybody in the field. And then I want to get more into, and this will get into a little bit about Superbrain, um, a book I wrote with uh, Deepak Chopra um, a couple of years ago, um, about what is Alzheimer's disease uh, teach us about the self? What happens to an Alzheimer's disease patient that can teach us about the self? And, you know, Alzheimer's is just an absolutely terrible disease. Let me ask in the audience, how many of you know an Alzheimer's patient or someone who's caring for an Alzheimer's patient? Raise your hand. So that's pretty amazing, right? And, and it's because we now live on average till 80 years old, and at 85, it's half the population that has this disease. And the average lifespan is 80, and it's getting all of modern medicines allowing us to live longer and lifestyle and, you know, the types of practices that we talk about here. But the dead end is um, Alzheimer's disease, and we need to learn how to deal with it. So what is Alzheimer's? Well, it's the most common form of dementia uh, in the elderly. Uh, people ask the difference. Well, Alzheimer's is a type of dementia, and if it's in an elderly person, it's most likely due to Alzheimer's. There are 5.4 million patients in this country, so it's really an epidemic. And uh, all of us begin the brain pathology by about 40 years old. So this happens with age, after about 40. And as I said, about 50% over those of 85 have this disease. Now what I'm going to tell you later is that the pathology for this disease begins 20 years before symptoms. And the reason why many of you have read in the newspapers that Alzheimer trials have failed is because we've realized, and I'll show you this, we're treating pathology that occurred 20 years ago and now we're treating the patient for that same pathology that already did its job. That's, so I'm going to explain that, and then this changes how we're going to think about trying to treat this disease and eradicate it. Risk factors include, number one, age, family history. Women get it more than men. But any insult to the brain, a head bang, even a really bad emotional trauma where you make high levels of cortisol that can kill neurons, a mini stroke you don't even notice, all of these insults to the brain uh, physical and emotional, really, can start neuronal cell damage, nerve cell damage, and then you can start forming some of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease in a vicious cycle. Uh, I'll tell you that that vicious cycle is inflammation, what are called plaques, I'm going to show them to you, what are called tangles. So there's many ways to get this fire started in the brain, um, but the most common way is this sticky material that... Uh, for which I discovered the gene and others back in the 80s, this bit sticky, gunky material that accumulates outside of nerve cells called amyloid. So let me just, before I get into it, just tell you that, you know, there are really no current drugs that treat um, this disease. It, they only treat the symptoms. They don't stop the disease. They're kind of better than nothing. They provide temporary benefit. But some of the things you can do to help reduce your risk are shown here. Uh, physical exercise. Physical exercise is incredible. It helps remove some of the pathology in the brain. It actually helps new nerve cells to grow in the part of the brain that's affected in Alzheimer's, the limbic system. Healthy diet, Mediterranean diet, uh, fruits, veggies, olive oil, less red meat. Um, I'm personally a vegetarian, but you know, even if you eat fish, you need to think about where that fish came from. Heavy metals are not good for you, and our oceans are getting rapidly more and more polluted. So think about that. Um, social engagement. Staying socially engaged, the brain likes that. And um, a couple of the Ayurvedics uh, that are good, a ashwagandha, uh, brahmi, um, also a, a Peruvian um, uh, herb called cat's claw um, has recently, these, this, these, I only include the ones where there's lab data showing that they help affect the pathology. I personally take one ashwagandha and one cat's claw um, a day. Um, and learning new things, so coming to this meeting Listening to these lectures, you're protecting your brain by just learning new things. And anybody, when we think, you know, there's all these brain games now, these different um, ads you see on the internet, Lumosity and the like, they're fun, but they don't protect your brain against Alzheimer's. And in fact, finally, Stanford University down the street put out a statement with 69 academics who have analyzed all the data, brain games are fun. And they might help you just stay focused and sharp, but they don't protect you against Alzheimer's. What protects you against Alzheimer's is learning new things. Because in the end, what causes Alzheimer's disease, what causes dementia, is you lose synapses. 
you have, a, you have a billion, 100 billion neurons making hundreds of trillions of connections or synapses. And when you lose those synapses, you lose the ability to learn, you lose the ability to recall information. And that's what our brain does. You know, if some of you were here, here earlier for the panel, we don't know how memories are stored. We don't know how to relate mind and consciousness to the brain, but we know one thing about the brain. It records, it organizes data and associates it and it recalls it. And this is what you lose because synapses are needed to do that. And as you get older, you need to think about not only saving money in the bank, the monetary financial reserves, but synaptic reserve. Because the more synapses you make by learning new things, you're reinforcing the synapses you already have. Why? All learning is by association. You learn new things and associate it with what you already know. So the more synapses you make and maintain, the more you can lose before you lose it. So for retirement, save money and save synapses, just as important. Um, reduce emotional stress. I'm, I'm just about to submit a paper that I did with Deepak Chopra and a host of other scientists on the effects of meditation um, on well-being. And we had amazing data, I'm not gonna show it today, but meditation um, uh, in an in actual controlled clinical trial that was done at the Chopra Center um, increased the anti-aging enzyme telomerase. We did this with Elizabeth Blackburn, the Nobel Prize winner who discovered telomerase. It caused um, gene expression changes that brought inflammation, the genes that cause inflammation were down. Um, um, genes, you know, basically all the, I won't go into the details, but genes you want to go down went down and many genes you want to go up went up in terms of activity. Uh, it was beyond, we couldn't have written this better. I mean, it was really beyond our wildest dreams how potent meditation is in terms of well-being. So there'll be a paper we're submitting soon and we're doing another study on that now. And sleep, okay, so sleep is really important. And I'm a real hypocrite when I say get eight hours of sleep because I don't. But the important thing about sleep is you need to sleep long enough to assure that you get slow wave deep sleep. That's when your brain goes into that delta wave state. And it's during slow wave sleep that I call it mental floss. Okay, because the brain actually contracts and starts to get rid of a lot of this crap that accumulates as you get older, like amyloid and other types of abnormal protein gunk that accumulates outside. The rest of our body has a lymphatic system. The brain doesn't have that. The brain have these cells called glia that help out the nerve cells, and they clean things when you're in deep wave sleep. So they're calling it the glymphatic system. New word. And um, also during uh, sleep, this is when the short-term memories in your limbic system actually get consolidated on your hard drive, the long-term memory. And that happens during slow-wave sleep. Um, so if you don't get slow-wave sleep, um, you know, you're not doing yourself a good uh, service. And as we get older, you know, it's tougher to sleep. And um, some people only get five to six hours of sleep. And it's a really a crapshoot as to whether you're getting slow-wave delta wave, slow-wave deep, deep delta sleep if you're only sleeping five or six hours a night. And again, I, I, I'm working on this myself. All of us have this issue of trying to get enough sleep, but I think we're gonna find more and more that sleep is essential and we have to just find ways to do it. Um, so people ask me, what's the difference between a senior moment and a, an Alzheimer's disease? So I have this slide here of, I know I came into this room for a reason. How many of you, you know, went into a room and then just stand there with your dog or your cat, looking at each other saying, why the hell are we here? What was that all about? Cat says, feed me. Um, how many of you, and be honest now, you're multitasking, you're on your computer, you're doing this, you're doing that, you pick up the phone, you call somebody, the phone's ringing, you're like, oh my God, who did I just call? <laughs> right? You're in a panic, like, shit, who's, who's that calling? Because these are, so, and, and I use this other one, you know, the, the, this is real, this uh, senior center, don't forget, senior center, remember to turn, senior center, wake up, Senior center, one twenty-four dollars Senior center, turn now. What this, what this demonstrates um, is that most senior moments as we get older come from lack of attention, okay? Consciousness requires awareness having attention. As we get older, it may be that we're less impassioned about the world, we're less excited. Maybe we, our bandwidth is too high, and maybe we're jaded, you know? Little kids learn so well because every moment's a real wow moment. Oh, wow, this is so cool. And they learn like crazy. And then we get older and it's like, so what? You, have, you go from wow moments to so what moments. 
you know, been there, done that, yeah, 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 I got other things to do. So all of this affects attention, and, um, but it's not necessarily Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease is very different. You know, attention, memory is, is really impacted by um, emotion. So if you're old enough, you know exactly where you were when JFK died or when the Challenger blew up or more recently when 9-11 occurred. You remember, how many of you remember exactly what you were doing when you heard about 9-11 and these events were unfolding? Almost everybody. Because when there's incredible amounts of emotion hitting your amygdala, right next door there's the hippocampus. That's Greek for seahorse. It's, it looks like this. That's where your short-term memory is. And then those memories just get almost instantly compacted and consolidated into your hard drive, into long-term memory. So kids are highly emotional. They're highly passionate all the time. They learn a lot better. And Alzheimer's disease is something different. Alzheimer's is where you have pathology that stops you from being able to learn effectively. So we think about Alzheimer's as a memory disease, but it's just as much, or maybe more, a learning disease. And here's um, just uh, uh, an example. I'll, uh, first, I'll, I'll just show you know, um, Alzheimer. When Dr. Alzheimer, when he described this disease in 1906 with his patient, August Dieter, 55-year-old woman, went to the Bavaria, uh, an asylum in Bavaria, and these are his own notes. And he said she was sitting on a bed with a helpless expression, and he said to her, what is your name? And, um, and she said, August, good. Last name? She said, August, wrong. And what's your husband's name? And she said, August, I think. So obviously she's having problems. And he said, how long have you been here? And she said, three weeks, and she had been there only for two days. And then he wrote in his notes that she, and he, he, he almost wrote this, you know, quite emotionally, that she then broke down and grabbed him and kept saying, Doctor, I have lost myself. I have lost myself. And that's what this disease is. It's a loss of self. And then you have to ask, given what happens in Alzheimer's, what is self? What are they losing when they feel like they've lost themselves? How do we... Now, let's think about what happens in Alzheimer's and think about what this teaches us about self. Well, at every moment... Even right now, you have sensory input coming in. You're, you're, you're looking, you're learning, you're listening. There's sensory information coming in. And um, right behind your forehead here, above your nose, back here, there's the entorhinal cortex. And you might, you might wonder why smell invokes such strong memories. It's because it's uh, so closely in this area where you have sensory information coming in. And then picture like balls of neuro, nerve cells back here. and then. They all go into one single cable that's called the uh, perforant pathway. And you can see in, in the slide that red, that red uh, streak coming, the hippocampus, the yellow is the entorhinal cortex, and there's a pathway that goes in. So if this is the hippocampus, like a seahorse, it perforates it. It's called perforant pathway. So all, that's how you learn. That's how you are able to take sensory information and you're able to remember what you just heard five minutes ago or 10 seconds ago. It gives you that continuity. What happens in Alzheimer's disease, inevitably, and we've known this since the mid-80s, is that perforant pathway breaks down. The pathology actually short-circuits it and severs it. So eventually, what will happen is the patient is sensing the world, but can't store it. How can you store it on your long-term memory if you never even have it on your short-term memory? So the perforant pathway is severed, and this then leads first to a loss of continuity of time. Right? You can, if you can't keep track now of what happened 10 seconds ago or even five seconds ago, you're losing continuity of time. And because you can no longer experience your world and associate new events with old events, in other words, learning, um, you don't have any context in terms of not only just time but also space. So sense of self requires integrating and associating the new information you receive in the context of both space and time. And if you can't do that, then you lose sense of self. Now, someone, I get this question, people will say, well, wow, so late stage patients are living in the moment. This is what most of us try to do. We're trying to have these, these great, um, you know, uh, experience of being completely present in the moment, no ego, no thought, no nothing. And that's great. It's great if you can experience that and then come back out of it and say, wow, that was cool. And that was great, but if, you, if, but if you can't do that, if you can't, there's no context for it, and you can't even know you're in the moment, it's terrifying. So you'll often see 
you know, an Alzheimer's patient in their eyes in their later stages, in you know, mid to late stages, in a room, and all this stuff is going on, and you can't, and every single new event in the room, you can't keep track of what happened five seconds ago. That's really terrifying. That's why this is such a horrible disease. Uh, eventually, patients will be out of it, but along the way, it can be quite horrific. First, frustrating, agitating, uh, horrific, um, and uh, it's all because self is not there to appreciate the moment. Self is not there to appreciate the moment. So what can we learn about ourselves? Sense of self requires memory. Uh, it, it allows uh, incoming sensory information to be placed in context and time and space and late stage Alzheimer patients eventually lose that sense of time and space and thus the sense of self. Now what are we gonna do about it? Well, what I've dedicated my life to is um, finding the genes that cause Alzheimer's because up until the 80s, we were just completely guessing that what causes this disease. We'd look at the brain, we'd see the pathology, the, these plaques looking like big boulders around the nerve cells. You'd see, as Alzheimer's described it, these tangles that choke the inside of nerve cells. You see the brain shrinking, undergoing atrophy. But it was like the five men in the room, the blind men, five blind men in the room with the elephant, just describing it, you have no idea what's going on. And then starting in the 80s and 90s, I and others started finding the genes that cause this disease by studying families. And um, I, uh, today I direct the uh, Alzheimer's Genome Project, as it's called, and now we have all these different genes. And what you're seeing here are the three main pathologies of Alzheimer's, the amyloid plaque, as it's called, the senile plaque up top, the tangles, those black things in there that are choking the inside of those nerve cells, and then you see inflammation. You see that the brain is under attack by its own innate immune system. And what, you, what we've learned in a nutshell, because normally I give a, a one or two hour lecture just to get to this slide, is that um, this pathology, all, they all drive each other. Inflammation, plaques and tangles, vicious cycle, every one of them can drive each other. And then we've now found after many years and millions and millions of dollars of work, the genes that seem to drive each of these pathological events, and those genes then give us the targets for therapeutic discovery. And that's what I spend most of my life doing. And this is what we learned. The first you get these senile plaques. They're made of something called amyloid. And then we believe the amyloid causes these tangles to form inside the nerve cells. That's the middle picture. And then eventually those tangles actually spread like a fire. So the way to think about this is the, the idea has been that the, as this amyloid accumulates as you get older, especially after 40, it's like lighting a match. The tangles are like a fire that then spreads through the brain, and then and you can see in blue the, uh, the, the spreading of the fire on the right side. And now the brain starts losing nerve cells as inflammation, and you get this vicious cycle of all this pathology. And we've learned something else from imaging, because imaging's come a long way in terms of being able to see this pathology in people. And what you're seeing in this slide, the bottom line is that amyloid, the, the plaques, occur 15 years before the symptoms. Look at that red line, right? As it's going up, there are no symptoms. Only when it starts plateauing at the top, you start to see MCI stands for mild cognitive impairment. So there's no sign of Alzheimer's until the plaques are done. So here's what happened in Alzheimer's research, and this is why we've, we've failed so far to come up with treatments. All the original genes I and others found in the 80s and 90s taught us one thing. These were the early onset familial genes that cause onset in 40s and 50s. All those genes had in common that they increase the accumulation of this amyloid in the brain. So all of pharma, biotech, labs, we all stopped, tried to stop the amyloid. And then we tried to treat patients who already had the disease. So you're trying to treat patients who are over here in, with dementia, you're trying to stop their amyloid, but guess what? Amyloid did its business, it's done. So it's kind of like having a patient who has a heart attack go to the doctor, and the doctor says, oh yeah, just take a Lipitor, just take a statin. You had to take that 15, 20 years before. We just learned this. We just learned it. So that's why we're so far behind. I'm not making excuses, but then basically you have to ask, well, what if we had a way to see the amyloid really early, and we do, we can image for it now pretty well, and when we see that at a certain age you get imaged, and the FDA approved the imaging, by the way, and you say, oh, you're 40 years old, we're going to image your amyloid, 
And if your amyloid is too high for your age, we're going to give you a drug, just like having a cholesterol test. Your cholesterol is too high. We want you to eat better, one less piece of pizza, exercise, but you also need a Lipitor or statin. And, and you image the amyloid and you say, you need to take this little pill that's going to bring your amyloid production down in your brain. We're working on these. In, in my lab, other labs are working on drugs that we think will safely bring down amyloid. And so now the person has the imaging, and then you say, take this drug, bring your amyloid down, and we treat it like we treat heart disease, bring your cholesterol down. You can also try to bring your amyloid down with meditation. You, there, are, there are other ways to do it, but you know, if you're in real trouble, just like with heart disease and cholesterol, you take a, a little white pill. Well, so insurance companies won't cover the amyloid imaging because they say there's nothing you can do about it because we don't have the drugs yet. We don't have the drugs yet because now the pharmaceutical companies are afraid to do the trials because you've got to do a prevention trial. And you've got to do those for five years. And they say, five years? You know how much? That's, like, that's billions of dollars, five years of time. And by the time we find that the drug works to prevent the amyloid, our patent is done. There's no patent protection. It's a generic. So the patent law is outdated. No one wants to do prevention trials, even though we're immersed in the era of personalized medicine, early prediction, early treatment but no one wants to do prevention trials because patent law doesn't allow it. So we're, we, we have a real problem here, right, you know, that, that needs to be solved. But the other thing you get from companies who, who make these drugs, they say, well, we don't know if the amyloid causes the tangles. Yeah, you have genes that first make amyloid, but how do you, and we know that the tangles are what kills the nerve cells and that's the fire that goes through the whole brain. But how do you know amyloid, how do you know that amyloid actually leads to tangles? And this is where, we get to um, last week um, in the New York Times uh, in a paper that we published in Nature, and we being uh, Duke Kim, uh, who's standing next to me there, who was really the leader and brains behind this work, myself, my wife Dora, Kovacs in the third row here, co-author, and um, a bunch of others, and we published this paper in Nature, and for the first time, we recreated Alzheimer's in a dish. And, we, and in a dish, we were able to make amyloid and we just wait a little longer, and we showed that, yes, indeed, amyloid drives the tangles. Debate over, 30 years of argument in the Wall Street Journal, everywhere else, amyloid causes tangles. Okay, now can we get on with it, FDA? Now can we do imaging and get these drugs through? How about we don't wait for prevention trials to stop amyloid? We showed you that we can see amyloid in the brain. We showed you amyloid causes tangles, and that gets this whole disease going. Please, let us develop, get amyloid drugs on the market if they're safe and take the same leap of faith you took when we put statins on the market and we didn't do five-year prevention trials for cholesterol and heart disease, right? They were a lot more progressive back then. So that's where we're at. And we're going to beg the FDA to do this because it's how we're going to eradicate this disease. See that amyloid early on and wipe it out. Now, now <laughs> yeah, so now, the only, there's other ways to get the tangles. I don't want you to think it's just amyloid. Play five seasons of NFL football, helmet to helmet, you don't need amyloid to get tangles. Um, battlefield, Afghanistan, one bomb blast, instant tangles, enough to then later give you Alzheimer's. At that point, when it's, when it's tangles causing the disease without the amyloid driving it, we call it chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Okay, so. Uh, just let me show you this uh, Alzheimer's in a dish. The big trick that Du Kim figured out is that, you know, we used to always grow these human nerve cells, make them stem cells, in liquid, in plates. And Du said, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure that the brain is not made of liquid. It's made of jello. The brain is like jello. So his, 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 basically his brainstorm was, excuse the pun, was, um, was to grow nerve cells in gel. So you're going to see here, the, uh, these are just, Nerves, ner human stem cells turn into neurons grown in a gel, and you can see how they're growing in three dimensions, right? And then you introduce the Alzheimer's genes into these nerve cells, and, um, and then the next thing you know, um, how do you turn this off? Oh my God, they won't stop moving. <laughs> we might just be watching this for the rest of the time, folks. There we go. All right, and the next thing you know, if you wait long enough, if you put those Alzheimer's mutations in that are supposed to make the amyloid plaques, yeah, you got them. That's that orange stuff in the middle. That's the amyloid plaque. And then you wait a little longer, look in the bottom right, you get the tangles. And if you do um, electron microscopes, microscopy, you can actually see, see the little twisty things? That's why they call neurofilbury tangles, and you, these are classic. So this is the first time full-blown Alzheimer's pathology was made in just eight weeks 
in a dish by using gel rather than liquid. And now we can use this system to quickly uh, screen all kinds of drugs that we couldn't do in mice, because mice suck, okay? <laughs> mice, when you put, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. So when you put, but I really feel that way. I mean, I like mice, but they, they're not great for the lab. And so when you put these Alzheimer's genes into mice, you get the amyloid, but you don't get the tangles. So you don't really get the disease. So they're a bad model. Now we've got a real model. And now we, we're, gonna, we're gonna take all 1,200 of the approved drugs on the market. Who knows, maybe some of them work against Alzheimer's. Take all of the drugs that have already gone through phase one for safety, throw them in this dish and see if they can work. And we've, we've begun doing that. This is one of the drugs we're developing. It's called the GSM and you can see on the, the panel that didn't get treated, you see all that plaque and, and stuff in the culture. And on the right, you don't see it because you added the drug. So we can t test drugs like this now in this dish in just six to eight weeks, what used to take um, over a year in mice. And, and, and folks, mice experiments are not fun. I mean, um, you know, it's funny because in our lab, we have probably more than your normal amount of vegetarians. We don't like, it's true, and myself and my wife, and we don't like animal experiments. So we're thrilled that hopefully with this system, we'll also rely less on um, having to do uh, experiments and also improve our karma a little bit along the way. So, um, so yeah. No, it's a big, I, I, it's, it, we're very happy about it. Thank you. So, um, so this is, so I'm just gonna show this. This is what we have to do. Right patient, right therapy, right time. So if you wanna prevent the disease, you treat amyloid early, you, then you treat the tangles that, that are caused by the amyloid. And for patients who have the disease right now, you have to actually stop inflammation. So I won't get into the details of it, but we've now found a bunch of genes that control inflammation in the brain, and we're figuring out how to target those with new therapy. So this uh, gets me to one of my favorite quotes from Einstein. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. So away from the mice, and this is our dream of our big 3D brain model someday. So far, we just got this side over here where we have the uh, amyloid making the tangles. We want to introduce all the inflammation side, the blood-brain barrier, all of this in a 3D system in gel in a dish where you can do experiments in six to eight weeks and uh, use these nanocomposite drug carriers to develop, to deliver the drug. This is now what we're aiming for, and we've already, we've now had to hire a lot of engineers to help start building these systems that do Kim, the original brain, uh, the brains behind us, will uh, be using. We're also going to get away from just drugs. Um, we're going to, we're branching out into some crazy stuff. Uh, this is Arnabon, I can't pronounce his last name, um, but he's, some of you may know him, and, um, and he came up with this idea that you can use vibrational frequency as a way to treat cancer cells. So example, so if you take, if you have cells in addition, some are cancerous and some are normal, they, they vibrate at different frequencies. And if you measure the frequency of the cancer cell and then you zap it with this vibrational frequency, the cancer cells die, but the normal ones don't. And this is just the beginning. So now we're saying, let's do the same thing with amyloid and tangles and start zapping this stuff with, instead of drugs, just do what the drugs do, cause vibrational frequency changes. So we're starting to do that. And I just hired his, uh, prodigy postdoc from India who's going to come in and uh, make these little nanobot thingies that I don't understand it, but they're going to go in and they're going to, we're going to measure the frequency and blast apart amyloid with, with nanobots. So more on that later. But in the end, what we're going to need to stop this disease is a, a cocktail that will stop the amyloid, the tangles, and the inflammation. But if you believe the University of Bordeaux, there may be a conflict of interest, they say you can all do all of this with just a glass of wine. So luckily we have lots of wine to drink here. Now this is, um, this is just a cartoon I like about wine where the scientists are saying red wine makes them live longer but they get to be a real pain. And this mouse says, hmm, it has a timid nose with the usual notes of oak and vanilla. And this mouse says, I can't believe you're drinking Merlot. So, so um, Okay, so now in, in, my, in my remaining time, I want to just say a little bit about Superbrain and um, uh, just because I, I covered it here last year and I just think, I want to say a few things about this book with Deepak Chopra. And you know, just to think about brain, mind, and self um, going beyond disease. You know, your brain, as I said, is billions of nerve cells, hundreds of trillions of connections. But the important thing to remember is your neural network is reshaping itself all the time with every action, thought, word, feeling due to neuroplasticity or reshaping your neural network. And with every experience, you're also reshaping your genetics. Even though the genes mom and dad gave you are not changing in terms of the DNA sequence, epigenetics says 
that with your, how you live your life, your change in gene activity, and you can actually offset susceptibilities to disease or behavior inherited by mom and dad by offsetting your gene activities up and down with your lifestyle. That's called epigenetics. So Deepak and I are writing a new book called Super Genes, where epigenetics will be the super genes as neuroplasticity was to super brain. Um, and that's ongoing. And it's important to remember that, that, you know, you shape your neural network and thus your world because your brain is projecting your world to you. I mean, your brain is three pounds of gel sitting in pitch darkness, completely silent, and it brings you this whole world, right? Your brain is bringing you your world. And what's the good news is, is that you have the ability to direct your own biological transformation. You affect your own neural network. You affect your own gene activity with your lifestyle, your choices, your perspective, your outlook. Um, everything. I mean, folks here are pretty enlightened people coming to a meeting like this. So you're doing a good job at the world you're making. But a lot of people need to be uh, reminded of this, which is why we write books like Super Brain and now Super Genes. And in Super Brain, we talked about the baseline brain versus the super brain. The baseline brain is basically one you need, right? It, it's minimal functioning, breathing, heartbeat, respiration, digestion. It gives you fear, so you avoid danger. You don't get into trouble, usually. It instills desire, so you look for sustenance and food, look for shelter, you try to reproduce. It's making the species keep going. It does a good job to ensure that the human species survives, but doesn't necessarily thrive, right? Just first priority is make sure it keeps going, and that's what the baseline brain does. The, the disadvantage of the baseline brain is it can keep you stuck in old um, habits. That, and uh, we heard a great talk uh, today from uh, 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 Rita Venturini who talked about habits and belief patterns that can really stun your growth. Um, when fears become phobias, desires become addictions, we tend to, to, to favor familiarity and, co and comfort over novelty and challenges. This is all coming from that baseline brain saying, don't do much, just stay alive and reproduce. Just reproduce, keep it going, it's okay. You know, and uh, it doesn't want us to think about a whole lot. So, so we t tend to become robots. We're, we don't tend to analyze the programs in our subconscious as much as we do upgrading programs on our laptops. That's a big problem. Um, it's reflexive awareness that leads to impulsive behavior and awfully, un awfully uh, uh, unhealthy behavior. So how do we break bad habits? And this is something we make a big point of. Look at this guy with the cigarettes. That's amazing, isn't it? That's, I think you're trying to break a record. I, couldn't, I had to put that picture in there. Um, but anyway, how do we break bad habits and negative conditioning? And, and Deepak, this is Deepak's thing, not mine, but don't resist, rewire, right? If you just try to not do something, resistance leads to persistence. So what you want to do is take time to observe your bad habits, and then repetition is what the brain responds to. Observe and then repetition of conscious healthy choices will actually rewire your neural circuitry. And if you rewire your circuitry, then you don't have to resist. Rewire rather than resist, just think about that. So the super brain tenets are basically you are not your brain, you are the user of your brain. You are not your brain, you're the user of your brain. That the real you is the self-aware being sitting on that mountaintop, looking down at what the brain is doing, remembering that the brain is an organ that serves you. It's like your stomach or your lungs, right? Your stomach has a nervous system. Your heart has neurons. All of these organs are serving you. They're not who you are. You don't say just because you're hungry, oh, I'm my stomach, you know? But your brain is bringing you sensations and images and feelings and thoughts to keep you alive and keep you su surviving. And you say, oh, that's who I am. Yeah, that's how, that's how I feel. And this is, this is the idea is to get away from that and to remember your brain is an organ serving you and you should use it. Don't let it, don't let it use you. So as often as you can ask, ask yourself any given moment of the day, I do it when I pull out my cell phone, which is all the time, and say, am I using my brain right now or is my brain using me? And just the fact that I'm addicted to email and text means my brain is using me, right? So um, that's an addiction. So um, now to understand this, if we get into the evolution of brain, memory, and mind, you probably many of you heard of the triune brain, and it starts with, um, first let me show you Dan Siegel's, how many of you know Dan Siegel's handy brain? A lot. Okay. For those you who don't know, put your hand up, put your thumb in, fingers over. Down here in the wrist area is the, is the oldest part of the brain, the reptilian brain. Open up. That's the limbic brain. That's what's affected in Alzheimer's, short-term memory, emotion. And then over here is the newest part of the brain, frontal cortex. So I'm going to show you those four, three regions. The reptilian brain is 300 million years old. It controls instinctive urges, 
allows you to breathe and swallow, have heartbeat, startle reflex. There's no need for memory here. You don't acquire anything. You just basically, it's the four Fs, fight, flight, feed, and procreate. Um, and then, then you have the, uh, my wife doesn't, you know, I'm sorry. I know you don't like that joke. Um, the, li the limbic brain, uh, on the other hand, is 100 million years old. Um, and this, this is, this is uh, newer, and this allows you to have emotion and uh, short-term memory. And, you know, if you read Nisa Gadata, right, I am that, very, he said very, very truthfully and correctly, fear is memory of pain anticipated into the future, that, that desires memory of pleasure anticipated into the future. So it's no mistake that emotions based on fear and desire first evolved with acquired memories, short-term memories. And then we got this four million year old newbie in the brain, the neocortex, now intellect, reasoning, logic, conscious intent, free will, um, regulating your emotions, um, empathy, giving you insight, meaning, purpose, and especially self-awareness. And what we've seen, if anything, in the brain is that as we're evolving, look what's happening. Selfishness from the brain stem is going down as the brain evolves, and the brain's evolving more towards self-awareness, meaning, and purpose. And that's good news. But it's only good news if you use it. Because, <laughs> because if you don't pay attention, that brain stem back there it's, it's 300 million, it's the veteran, 300 million years in the locker room. It says, we're doing it my way, okay? And if anybody thinks when they wake up, you may be as enlightened as you want when you go to bed. When you wake up in the morning, that brain stems there saying, let's go. And unless you're mindful about it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to drive you. So you have to remember that, that neocortex and these other areas. And what you really want to do is use all three. I mean, all the greats, Galileo, da Vinci, they were driven by the brain stem. They had the desire to succeed from the limbic system. They had the dream and vision from the frontal cortex. When all three of those are working, that's when you really kick ass. So self-awareness is the key to optimizing the world that your brain is bringing you, specifically your own world. Now, I want to just make one example before I end, and that is that you know, your brain is bringing you, as I said, sensations, images, thoughts, and feelings that are perceived through your mind. Now, when you see a lemon, right, your lemon is bringing you the image of a lemon right now. Would you say, I am a lemon? No. Your brain brought you an image of a lemon. You say, I see a lemon, right? But somebody throws the lemon at your head, hits you in the head with a lemon. Your brain brings you pain. And then you say, I am angry. I am angry. Well, wait a minute. Same thing. Your brain just brought you the feeling of anger. Brain brings you the feeling of, it brings you the image of a lemon. You don't say, I'm a lemon. If the brain brings you anger, it's for a reason. It's, you should then say, my brain just brought me the feeling of anger observe it and move on. Simple trick. But you guys all know this. Um, uh, when you have a cold, you don't say, I am a cold. But if you feel depressed, you say, I am depressed. Well, I am is a very powerful statement. And be very careful with what you use, what you put after I am. Because if you say it enough, again, your brain is just a victim of repetition. It will believe you. So you have to use I am very carefully. So the pathway to a super brain in closing, is observe your feelings and thoughts that your brain delivers to you. Don't regret the past or fear the future. This leads to stress and limiting belief systems about yourself. Strive to learn from the past, plan for the future, but all while living in the present. Observe routine and conditioned behaviors and habits, and the ones you don't like to rewire rather than resist with observation and repetition. I didn't talk about this, but especially avoid judgment and prejudice both toward yourself and others, and this way you can break the routine of programming and clear the way for intuition and right action. And I love this quote from um, Einstein, that the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. He was a pretty smart guy. Now, I'm going to close, but um, can I play a song just before we, is that okay? Thank you. So I'm going to, it's a song. I, I want to tell you, you know, besides doing Alzheimer's research writing a book, I also am a musician. And um, this is, I, I played on the last Alice Smith album. This is the Jay Leno show. And you can see Joe Perry looking very cool as a rock star. And that bewildered guy in the back on keyboard saying, what the hell am I doing here is me. And um, <laughs> so um, I won't get into the story, but basically I, I play with Joe Perry's band and I, and I do music on the side. But more recently, I worked with this guy, um, Chris Mann. Uh, who's an, I don't know, how many of you heard of Chris Mann? Raise your hand. A few. So he's new. He, he started on The Voice. And he, 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 just, he just had an adult contemporary album that went to number one. Incredibly talented guy. His father has Alzheimer's. Um, I have a song that I wrote 10 years ago uh, when, uh, honestly, when my cat died. I felt we loved this cat. 
Mariko, and she died, and I wrote this tender song called Mariko's Song, and my wife kept saying, you got to do something with the song. And when I met Chris Mann and, and heard him sing, I said, I got the perfect song for you, and we turned Mariko's Song into a song about Alzheimer's. And, um, and the song is called Remember Me, and we want to use this to raise money for Alzheimer's and raise awareness, saying, and it's the patient singing Remember Me. Now, it's going to be it's a bit of a sad song, but um, I want you to hear it. We just, uh, it's basically Chris Mann on vocals, uh, there's piano, and we also have real strings and uh, uh, cello on it as well. So I just want to end by playing it, uh, just because we want to bring awareness to this disease. So let me, let me bring this back. And... So I'll end it there, and we'll never give up till we stop this disease, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You're embarrassing me. <laughs>